Nice, we got a good mix today. Okay, well, um, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this uh, another episode of the UK Anthology. It's a series that we're hosting as Repeat. Um, and this uh, episode today is about land ownership and peatlands. Um, yeah, we do this uh, series every month uh, since the start of the year uh, until COP26. And every time we choose a different topic related to uh, peatlands in the UK. Um, so we've had a couple already. You can watch them back on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll have them and yeah, we're very happy to uh, be sharing this space with you all tonight again. Um, so I'm Irene, I'm part of the repeat team. Uh, I'm Dutch, but uh, currently living and studying in Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, so I hope to be a bit of a neutral voice maybe on this topic. I have no relation to the UK whatsoever, but I'm very curious about the topic. Um, so uh, what we have today is we have um, three different uh, initiatives uh, with speakers. Uh, we have Hazel from Wildcard, Jenny and Angela from um, the Langholm Initiative, and we got Paul Turner, uh, who is a climate breakdown teacher. Um, we'll have uh, presentations by each speaker, and then we open the floor for a discussion. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to already uh, note them down for yourselves or write them in the chat and then uh, we will come back to them at the very end of the session uh, but if they're quick clarifying questions uh, just feel free to also put them in the chat during the session and then we can touch upon them as we go um so a little bit more about our speakers hazel from wildcard uh, she um, has been working on pushing uh, big landowners in the UK to rewild their lands. Jenny and Angela are part of uh, a really successful campaign of a community buyout of a moorland. Uh, and Paul has done a lot of work uh, on um, setting up the Radical School uh, Geography Group and making freely accessible resources, um, such as the climate breakdown teaching materials. Um, so I would like to just give the stage to the first speaker, Hazel. Um, and I think, Hazel, you'd like to share your screen. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, we would like to start with video. Sorry, Hazel. <laughs> um, one of our team members, Frankie, uh, she's been working uh, as well, along with the other team members on a video. Uh, and we would like to start with that to give everyone an introduction of the topic that we're addressing tonight. Peatlands and land ownership. Did you know that the UK has the most concentrated large-scale land ownership pattern compared with any other country in the world? Half of England is owned by less than 1% of the population. In Scotland, 0.008% of the population owns 50% of the rural land, and rural land accounts for 98% of Scottish land area. Many large land holdings have been held by the same families for hundreds of years. Land ownership is a complex and long story, and it interacts with peatlands in a number of ways. In this video, we're going to zoom into one aspect of this topic, which is the UK's grouse moors. First off, what is grouse? Well, grouse are a medium-sized red and grey bird that are reared as game on British heather moorland. The grouse shooting season starts on the 12th of August, often called the Glorious 12th, and ends on the 10th of December each year. Shooting takes place on grouse moors which cover almost 17,000 square kilometre of land in the UK. They are artificial landscapes managed by regular burning. This burning process creates large amounts of young heather for the grouse to feed on. It also removes any trees and grasses and kills a variety of small animals that might create competition for the birds. Evidence suggests that birds of prey and foxes are also cold in these areas. In their natural state, British moorlands are a carbon sink. However, the burning of these peatlands releases the stored carbon into the atmosphere, increasing CO2 levels and contributing to the climate crisis. In addition, heather burning has a detrimental impact on the peat hydrology, peat chemistry and local ecology. 
By reducing the growth of sphagnum mosses and the density of microinvertebrates, the entire food chain is affected. As is the case with complex topics, there are towns and communities who are in favour of grouse shooting. Not least, many towns are reliant upon income that's generated by these estates. However, research has actually shown that national parks and ecotourism are 32 times more successful for the local job market. And despite being owned by some of the richest people in the country, in 2020, Grouse Moor Estates in the UK received roughly £10 million in taxpayer subsidies via the EU's Common Agricultural Policy. And one day of grouse moor shooting can cost up to £30,000, making it a very exclusive activity. Clearly, the management of grouse shooting is a practice that excludes the vast majority of us and has a negative impact on the local ecology and people. So how did we get here? Well, back when much of the peat in the UK was forming, it wasn't owned by anyone. It was held in common and was shared by the community. But this all changed with the first Act of Enclosure in the UK, which dates back to 1235. This started a process of land privatisation, which has been upheld through generations. The results of which can be seen in the grouse estates of today. So where can we go from here? Solutions to this issue range from excluding grouse moors from agricultural subsidies and applying inheritance tax to grouse moor estates, to community buyout initiatives and showing landowners how to and the advantages of restoring their peatlands. After all, land justice goes hand in hand with environmental and social justice. And we all have a role to play. Thank you for that. I think that gives a really good um, overview and summary of the situation at hand. Uh, and I hope that now that we have a little bit of context of uh, what is going on, we hope to be zooming into initiatives that um, work on solutions uh, towards healthy peatlands and social justice. So now I would like to give the floor to Hazel. Um, who is part of uh, the Wildcard Initiative. Uh, and Hazel, I think you should still be able to share your screen, right? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Would you also yeah. like to turn your camera on? Ah, um, sorry, I didn't realize my camera was off. No, I think it was like an automatic Zoom uh, reflex when the okay. sc uh, screen got shared, but I think it's good now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Take it away. All right, you can hear me okay and everything, yeah? Yeah, uh, right. So cool. So uh, Wildcard, here we are, is um, like a small group of a mix of people. We've got ecologists and experts. We've got artists and campaigners. Um, and we're challenging really high profile landowners in the UK to take responsibility for the way um, they use their land for nature um, and for the future of the nation, really, um, by rewilding. Myself, I became involved in it as a peatland campaigner as it happens, and um, because I'd really, really like to see um, these habitats that we just saw in that excellent film restored to this glorious, biodiverse, sphagnum rich habitat that I know that they're meant to be. But for that to happen, we kind of need to put pressure on the landowners. Um, with the land rights debate, we've had a lot of talk about who owns land and how they got to to own it but there's this intersecting question about how the land is managed and the effect of that um, historically that was very much about production of food but we're in a situation now where we've got this climate crisis we've got this nature crisis and there are other questions that are becoming into stark relief about how that land is used for the good of everybody um, so one of the issues um, why it's so important to me is kind of explained by these two images. And those of you who know a lot about Pete will know about the connection between these two. Um, but that on the left is a picture of my hometown in the Calder Valley, <clears throat> um, which 
unfortunately floods it's a place where I volunteer as a flood warden and we're finding over the past few years uh, it's been increasingly difficult because the speed at which the water comes off from the moors and how quickly it rises makes things really really difficult for us um, so you can be like helping somebody with a drain and then you look about and you realize that you can't actually do anything that the water's rising so so quickly and all that you can do is to tell them to get their children out of the house because their house is going to flood and you can't stop that happening and that's to do with the speed um and you've got like a road becomes a, a raging river people can't get to their businesses to save them i had a bloke who was trying to get his to his mother who was on her own and was completely cut off by flood water so for all the talk about the financial benefits of grouse shooting, you know, in our town, it's like this human cost that we see. And in the aftermath, you see people like broken um, and the community just gather around and they do everything they can, everything within their means to make things right and to try and help them. But one thing that is beyond the means of the community is, kind of addressing the source of the problem because the source of the problem is this picture on the right, um, the Grousemore estate above us. Um, this picture I took myself in 2016 on the glorious 12th or the inglorious 12th and um, when some campaigners took me up there to see the barren bare peatland that had been produced in that area. Um, it's kind of the effect of grouse shooting is shown more clearly on these two images. These are Google satellite images of the Walshaw Moor estate above my town in Hebden Bridge. Um, it's the before and the after of intensive grouse moor management. So in the second picture, we've seen a landscape that is burnt and drained. You can see those kind of lines, their grips, which the water has drained off and it's draining off very quickly from that moorland right down to us. And it's all so that people can shoot birds and um, the more grouse, the better, because the game of grouse shooting is about bagging food for your family. It's about bagging as many birds as you possibly can. Um, and they pay. So as we saw earlier, they pay such a lot to do. it. It's a really lucrative industry and that makes it much harder with the money there. It makes it much harder for us to challenge it um, and we get told you know we, that we have no right it's not our land uh, they talk on social media almost like it's the equivalent of me trying to being told what to do in my lawn or something like that and what they do with their land so there is this real intersection between land ownership and land management and the effects of people um, what should be happening on a healthy moorland, as you probably know, is that the mosses should be soaking up that water and it should be naturally pooling and the water should be slowed in the way it flows so it doesn't rise so quickly so that we have time to, refer, uh, to take action. Um, in our community, we've had protests about it, we've had petitions to Parliament about it, we've had scientific research conducted it's been such a long process to try and get anybody to listen. Finally, this year, the government have actually said that there is a link between what's happening on the moors and what's happening in our towns. Um, so that's one thing. But when it comes to action, what's going to happen there? We've had this, um, we got really excited when we saw they were bringing in legislation on burning. Um, but that legislation is so full of loopholes um it's kind of we don't even know if it will still continue to be burnt those the land above us um so it's it can go some way but it's not really the answer so there's this opportunity that parliament have to make a difference and they're not even taking it and that's why wildcard are actually taking this to the landowners themselves um we're trying to get them to recognize the responsibility that their privilege affords and make the moral case for change. And the moral case for change is massive. It's really strong because rewilding has a great deal of potential. Um, those of you who know about Pete know what it can do. 
it's not just about preventing flooding, it's also about nurturing biodiversity. And in Britain today, we're one of the most nature depleted places on the planet. Um, 40% of our species have been in decline since the 1970s. 30% of our birds are threatened with extinction. So our lands shouldn't really be monocultures for making money. We want to see hen harriers and we want to see dragonflies and mountain hares and sundew and sphagnum, not just red grouse and heather. Not only that, but um, rewilding can draw millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere because it restores and protects our living systems. As you probably know, restored healthy peatland can sink far more carbon per acre than a rainforest. So the need for rewilding is scientific fact. It's not a ma matter of debate, really. And it's not just about saving my town from flooding. It's pretty much about saving the entire planet. So it has to be a central part of any conversation about addressing climate change. And equally, landowners need to be held account uh, as a central part of any discussion on rewilding because it can't just take place on my lawn. I'm doing no mow May, I'm doing the high July. It might be working for the pollinators like a little tiny, tiny bit, but imagine the impact if you had, for example, ecological restoration of the entire grouse moors at Balmoral. Um, that, that would be a real game changer. Um, so as we talk about the royal family, the land holdings of the royal family are vast. Um, the queen owns 45,000 acres in the Duchy of Lancaster, 20,000 acres in Sandringham Estate, 50,000 acres in the Balmoral Estate. When it comes to Prince Charles, his portfolio includes 130,000 acres of the Duchy of Cornwall, and excuse my pronunciation, it's very English, uh, 6,700 acres at the Grouse Moor Delnadamf Estate, uh, which is near Balmoral. Uh, altogether, the um, rural's own land, which is six times the size of the Isle of Wight. It's a huge, huge amount. And it's making them incredibly wealthy too. Um, the Duchy of Lancaster alone was recently valued at 534 million pounds. And it provides the Queen with 20 million pounds of income per year. Prince Charles is earning a similar amount from the Duchy of Cornwall. Yet, by their own ambition, they're managing some of these lands as sporting estates. So their estates are being managed to maximise profit rather than to restore nature, um, catering to sporting tastes rather than to what we know has to happen. Um, and they know it as well. You know, on the Radio 4 programme, the Prince of Wales um, spoke about the need to restore our natural, our natural systems. Um, but we need to have more than just talk, we need bold action. And we also need to go beyond just giving trees away to plant for the Royal Jubilee or creating wildlife corridors with a few flowers. Um, they own so much and a lot of that is nature depleted landscape. We need this to be rewilded because we need to put nature before profit at this stage that we're at. Um, and the royals need to step up and restore their land for the good of um, their subjects, uh, our children, for the future of life on earth. And so that's why we um, set about launching our campaign um, by addressing the royal family. Uh, in June, we had a letter that um, went to the royals it was backed by more than 100 leading academics, experts, public figures. Um, the signatories included leading environmental scientist, Professor Sir Robert Watson, um, Sir David King, who's the head of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. Uh, we had broadcasters such as Chris Packer, Manita Rani, and Hugh Fernley Whittenstall. And the letter itself, which you could read on our website, calls on the Queen and the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge to help tackle Britain's biodiversity crisis and to show real climate leadership by prioritizing biodiversity on their lands. 
um, and creating and restoring ecosystems like forests and heathlands and grasslands and bogs and swamps and rivers, um, both for the wildlife within them and for the carbon sinking. Um, our letter also inspired others to write letters, including this, my favourite letter, um, from Matilda, age five, to the Queen, asking her to think about rewilding her lands. Um, and it wasn't just Matilda. Um, lots of, there's lots and lots of public support for this. Comrades interviewed um, 2,108 UK adults online and found that three in five agree that the royal family should rewild their estates. Just one in 12 saying that they disagree. So this is a huge demonstration of public opinion for rewilding. Um, as far as we're aware, this is the first survey of this type. We've also had uh, Rewild the Royals petition, which has received over 100,000 signatures, which we ran in collaboration with 38 Degrees. And we're gonna be presenting that to the Royals next month to see what happens there. Because what we really want is to strengthen the voices in this campaign, um, bring people's passion to it, to turn it into tangible action from the Royal family and the other people that we're pursuing on this. Um, we've not heard from the royal family yet, but the Crown Estate, which is managed by the government for the Crown, uh, you know, it belonged to the Queen, but it's managed by the Crown and the profits go to us. They've said that they will meet with us to discuss it. So we'll see what happens there. Um, the other aspect of what we're doing is we want to highlight to the wider community the issues of land ownership and the importance of rewilding. So we've been really pleased to see it hit the papers and not just amazing articles in The Guardian and The Ecologist, but also mainstream um, sources like BBC Newsround. And here's Emma getting very excited because we got a double page spread in The Express. So it's really getting the message out of the bubble to the wider public. The Express is read by lots of people who really like the royal family. Um, so we want to get people talking. Um, and as well as the royals, the other campaigns have been to reweld the church and reweld Oxbridge. These are three of the UK's ancient institutional landowners and each, even today, play a part in the moral, spiritual and educational stewardship of our country. They're really respected and looked up to. We also own vast swathes of land in our country and symbolically, they can lead the way, they can influence the decisions of other big landowners. If they start to rewild, then others will follow. Um, so within the church and within the Oxbridge colleges, you have got a lot of people who really care already about these issues. Obviously, with Oxbridge, you've got the people who are writing the papers about what's happening on the planet um, and talking about the recommendations. And in their hands, uh, the Oxbridge Colleges hold one of the answers to this. Um, they have the large scale land ownership um, with the opportunities that comes with. So although we've already persuaded them to make changes or people have already persuaded them to make changes like beautiful rewilded graveyards and wildflower meadows on the college green, um, we need them to do much more. The Oxbridge Colleges have £3.5 billion worth of land, and that's 126,000 acres or four times the size of Manchester. Um, so there's a lot of potential for what they could do on that land, especially with the knowledge that they have. When it comes to the church, they have 100,000 acres, and they also have a faith that this is God's creation, and it's a gift from God, which they are to be stewards of. So they can bring this as an example of care and love for the planet and care and love for the people of the planet who rely on it because it's an issue, you know, climate change goes beyond the land that we're standing on. It goes throughout the world. If we can have rewilding here, it has an impact across the globe. So um, we know that we need to rewild. The UK's Independent Climate Change Committee has said as much um, they said that rewilding, restoring, protecting Britain's national, natural habitats is a key measure that could help us to cope with the climate crisis. Um, they've also included advice that 
the government need to rewet 100% of upland peat moors urgently because the longer that we leave it, if the temperature rises, then we've got more problems with wildflowers and it makes it harder and harder to rewet the land. Uh, it will get more and more damaged. So it's an urgent thing, this. And whilst rewilding is one of the most efficient ways of climate proofing for the future, whether that's going to happen or not is currently up to the people who own the land. No matter what the science is saying, nothing seems to be changing. So that is why Wildcard is setting up this vision for these three respected institutions so that they can act in a really real and meaningful sense and lead the way for landowners across Britain, creating models of what could potentially happen. Um, and then this will allow them to serve the people, not just those who possess land, but also people who have no land of their own and then create a more positive future for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hazel. And um, there is also a question if you would like to share the link to the reports that show the benefits of the ecotourism of a grouse forest. Um, so when you have the chance, uh, please. That was uh, in the video. Chat. That was in the video, I think. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, then I would like to pass it on to the next speaker, uh, or next speakers rather, who are taking a slightly different approach to this issue of privatised peatlands uh, that are suffering under uh, the hobby of grouse shooting. Um, they uh, have had a successful community buyout, uh, so I would like to give the stage to Jenny and Angela from the Langholm Initiative. Great, thank you. Um, right, I'll just try and share my screen and then we'll get started. Right, that should work now. Is that right? Brilliant. Well, um, firstly, Hazel, that was such a good presentation. It was so interesting. I think that's led really nicely onto what we're going to talk about next. Um, so, um, firstly, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having us this evening. Um, so um, really looking forward to the discussion at the end um, and hearing your thoughts about um, our story in Langham. Uh, so we're going to be talking to you today um, about Langham, which has led um, South of Scotland's, one of South of Scotland's biggest uh, historic buyouts. Um, and I think for us and for many of the people around the world that supported us, it offers a really powerful story of hope and community. Uh, so by way of introductions, I'm Jenny Barlow, so I'm newly recruited estate manager uh, for the community-owned estate, which we're, is now called Taras Valley Nature Reserve. I'm also joined by my colleague, Angela Williams, uh, who is the new development manager for the reserve. So we're going to just do a bit of a double act. Uh, I'll just re um, give a bit of a, um, a cover on what we're going to talk about, and then I'll hand over to Angela, and then she'll hand back to me. Um, so... What are we going to be covering today? Uh, so a really quick recap on community land ownership in Scotland. Um, and then we'll be doing a bit of a welcome to Langham. So we'll be giving you an overview on background to the town. And then we'll be doing a look back over the last 18 months, which has been quite a whirlwind. And how we've got here, how we've got to this place of community ownership. And then covering a little bit about what we've actually bought as part of that ownership. And then most importantly, what's coming next, what are we doing next now the land is in community ownership. And then just a bit of a summary about what that land ownership means to us in Langham. And um, so I'm just gonna hand over to Angela now. Okay, thanks very much for that, Jenny. Um, do you wanna go on to the next slide? Oh yeah, have you got it? Yep, that's fine. Oh, I yep. delayed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, that, that's it. That's great. <laughs> um, just before we sort of kind of go into what's happening with the Langham Initiative and the Terrace Valley Nature Reserve, um, just going to try and give a very quick background summary about community land ownership in, in Scotland. Um, some of you may be very, very familiar with it, um, but some of you may not. Um, I think as was highlighted in the um, initial video, which was brilliant, as was Hazel's presentation, this is just such a good night. Um, 
the land ownership pattern in Scotland is very, very skewed with a, a very small number of private individuals owning an awful lot of land. Um, so whole whole background of historical issues there. Uh, but obviously, um, once you've got land, it kind of gives a lot of power and, and control. Um, and over the last sort of 20 years or so, um, sort of really sort of back going back to the 90s, um, we started to see a movement of local communities actually saying, I'm not happy with the land owner, landing, land owning situation where I live and we're going to do something about it. Started off with the Ascent Crofters and then the Islanders on Egg bought out their island. This was followed by Noidart, followed by um, the Ascent community out in the Outer Hebrides and it's been a sort of ongoing um, growth. Um, it was supported very much by land reform legislation, which gave a process for communities to register an interest in land, providing they could actually prove that there was a good need for it. And certainly when it first started, um, this community ownership, um, it was often a reaction to sort of lack of investment by the landowner of the day. And it was seen as a way of tackling depopulation, of poor housing, of social inequalities, of not being able to get a lease to take your business forward. And within that, you'd always got a backdrop of, of the land and the stewardship of the land by the local people was very much a given. I mean, the reality often was, especially up, up in the Highlands, quite often you would have issues around deer management. And sometimes the investment in developing the land might actually sort of take a, a lower ranking over some of the activities because the sort of social um, inequalities that might be going on with the community would often be higher. So trying to sort out housing, trying to sort out um, good leases so that people could actually earn a living and, and live there. Um, being hugely lucky in Scotland, we have a Scottish Land Fund, which has helped communities buy that. And we've also had a huge amount of support from the development agencies um, that's HIE up in um, the Highlands and now down in the south we've got the South of Scotland Enterprise. As we've had the past 20-25 years of all the growth of community buyouts in the Highlands, now sort of the middle of Scotland but also moving down to the south of Scotland, we're now starting to see the same thing happening. Um, so what we've developed with the Taras Valley Nature Reserve is the largest community buyout in the south of Scotland. Now, compared to other land holdings at 5,000 acres, it's not huge. Um, as you'll hear later on, we're hoping that's going to increase to 10,000, but it is a start and it gives the community a huge amount of control and a say in what actually happens or what doesn't happen on the land. So next, next uh, slide. Sorry, there's a tiny bit of a delay with the Wi-Fi. Ah, brilliant. Oh, thanks, Jenny. Um, so a little bit about Langham. Um, we're a small town um, in Dumfries and Galloway in the south of Scotland. A very much an, a mill town, or was a mill town, uh, with a population now of around 2,000. Um, we've seen um, a lot of the mills run down over the last few years, and in fact, there's of the big working mills, none are actually active at the moment. There's a, a handful of small niche mills who are often serving um, sort of quite upmarket, the Victoria Beckham um, companies, rather than the wholesale mill production that we've seen in the past. But as a town, it's got a huge amount of um, community ethos, just about all the services a community run, whether or not it's the paper, whether or not it's the um, local play groups or what have you. Um, it's got, as a community, it's got a huge amount of cultural connections with the land. Um, the common riding, which takes place on the last Friday of July, um, is the continuance of a 275 year tradition where the locals are actually marking the boundaries of the commons. But as the textile industries have declined, um, there's been questions as to well, what happens now? How, how, as a town, how as a community, do we actually sort of make a living? And the idea of looking at a nature-based economy um, has 
has grown out of that, that need to look at how, how do we create a viable future for us and for our children in, in the area. So the Langham Initiative has um, existed for around 25 years as a development trust. Um, it's run an awful lot of projects, but actually taken on board the idea of a community buyout of lands from the Duke of Buclue, for whom an awful lot of people have worked for over, over many years and often over generations, um, has probably been its biggest project. Okay, Jenny. So um, the area involved, um, it had been subject of an awful lot of research for many years by the Buclua states and other parties, trying to see how you could, um, whether or not you could actually have a financially viable grouse moor, as well as protecting ra raptors and seeing whether or not those two could come, could have some sort of balance. The outcome of the research, which I think was a 10 year project, was that it wasn't financially viable. So the Buclua Estates put the land up for sale. Um, it was a northern and southern bit, 10,000 acres in total, 10,500 acres in total, with a price tag of £6.4 million. After a huge amount of community engagement, um, now Virginia, I can take credit for it because we're quite new into the jobs, but we obviously are aware of all the work that has gone on behind the scenes and also we're aware of it at the time as we, we watched it from our respective jobs over the last couple of years. Um, it must have seen an impossible challenge to the community, but they absolutely rose to it. And they started negotiations with the Buclua Estates, a business plan was drawn up and a huge, public campaign and crowdfunder um, literally snowballed. And we have had total global interest, I think from so many countries around the world with donations from major funders, private individuals, as well as grant giving bodies such as the Scottish Land Fund and South of Scotland Enterprise themselves. So, you know, that's been from your five pound donation from, um, you know, a local pensioner living in the town through to um, substantial donations from all over. So in six months, 3.8 million was raised. There was a very tight time scale and hard decisions had to be taken. So it was agreed that um, rather than risk losing the wholesale, that um, the 3.8 million was going to allow us to buy the southern half of the land, 5,200 acres, and including extensive peatlands. And it was agreed that we could go ahead with the purchase of that, but that the Clue Estates also agreed to hold off the sale of this sort of northern part, which is the area that's probably got most it's peatlands. So reminding me it started. I started making bread. And we've got until March 2022 to actually raise money for that. If we get that second phase buyout, um, we will then be the proud owner of over 10,000 acres of land that we can look for ecological restoration. So we now have a big target. Um, we've got to raise 2.2 million, that's a 1.9 million price tag for the second phase buyout. We've got to allow for legal fees and also to try and give ourselves a little bit of working capital. Um, but you'll find out more about this in the next few slides. So back to you, Jenny. Great, thanks. Um, so just following on from that, I thought it would be really useful to just cover like what have we actually committed to do and work towards under community ownership. Um, so a little bit on the aims that were in our buyout campaign. So as you'll see, they are quite high level and it gives us a lot of scope to be able to work together to make the decisions. Um, at, you know, and we really are at the very start of that journey into community ownership. Um, so. The main idea is that Langham will be a revitalised community in a restored landscape as an exemplar of 21st century land management. Um, and we've got some other sort of high level kind of objectives that set the kind of skeleton structure for how, but the detail is very much to be worked out in like, you know, collaboratively. Um, so just picking a few of them off that the, um, the 
land that has been bought will will be working towards getting national nature reserve status for that and um, so it will become the national Taras valley nature reserve um, and also most importantly underpinning everything we do with the land in terms of large scale ecosystem restoration will be creation of new economic employment opportunity and employment opportunities which arise from our ownership of the land so that it does it, it helps to build a holistic approach into the future um, and that it is economically um, you know it's sustainable um, and also um, you know recognizing the really important role that we can play within carbon capture and climate um, change mitigation um, as well and obviously um, improved access and uh, connection with the land uh, by local people and um, so what have we actually bought and um, so with the help of thousands of very generous donors and supporters from Langham all the way to Australia, um, we were able to prefer, uh, purchase a very diverse landscape. Obviously, there is a lot of restoration that is needed, but it gives us that landscape scale. And um, that picture in the background, I put that in because that shows the boundary, that wall goes. Um, so on the right is community ownership, on the left is not. So you can see that land has already started to recover, but there's a long way to go. We've got a, you know, a big task ahead of us, but the scale this gives us is landscape scale, which is what we need for climate action. Um, and obviously, you know, nature recovery networks, we need scale. Um, so, um, we, it's an upland estate, but it's not just the moor. We've got ancient woodlands, um, commercial, some commercial forestry, extensive peatlands, and um, lots of amazing floodplain meadows. And so it is a, it's a lot more diverse than um, just the moorland. Um, and it's all situated within the Taras Valley. So we also are, uh, have a triple SI and uh, so site of special scientific interest and also a special protection area for our hen harriers. Um, so it, we've got a national, nationally significant nesting site. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm sure I, I'm probably mentioning something that everybody knows, but there are, they are one of our most persecuted and endangered raptors. So we're really proud to have them on the reserve. And there's been an amazing, you know, multi-agency community led effort to safeguard the nests on the land for a very long time. Um, so, which is really amazing. Um, so apart from um, the land, we've also got six properties. So there's four tenanted out of those and two vacant. Um, I think Angela touched on this earlier, but in the second buyout, what that would give us is the headwaters of the catchment. So we'll have the whole, you know, the whole catchment from the source right down. Um, so with that comes extensive peatlands, which are in pretty poor condition. So they are without a doubt a source of carbon emissions at the moment. Um, as, but it is an extensive upland habitat um, and also comes with that two properties. Um, and I think one thing I wanted to mention here um, that probably something that wasn't in the sales valuations and all the legal documents, but is, is something that you can't put a price on necessarily, which is that cultural significance of the land. Um, I think Angela mentioned this earlier, but the land for the common riding, which the community have marked out every single year marking out the boundaries of the common land for 250 years that land's now in community ownership um, which is you know it's a very uh, powerful symbol um, uh, you know for the people's connection with the land and um, so what's next i think that's probably the really important bit of what we actually do now so now the land's in community hands um, we're recruiting five new members of staff, so that includes me and Angela, um, and I think I've seen Kat on the call as well, so um, Kat just joined with us earlier this week, um, and we've got two other um, posts that we're um, in the process of recruiting for, so we've got um, to take that reserve forward, um, so and one of the most important things to say at the moment, we are six weeks into being recruited, is that one of the most the prior priorities is a really extensive programme ongoing of community participation and developing, co-designing and collaborating anything that we do, any plans that are made, any decisions that we create that structure so that it is a collaborative co-designed um, and also the fact that you know it reflects the aspirations in the, of the community and what we do next and 
you know, is going to be very evolving and dynamic and we need to be flexible to adapt because I think we're all, you know, we're all learning. It's new for all of us. And, um, you know, the, the staff and the community is, you know, it's a new, a new chapter for us all really. Um, so in terms of like Langham Initiative's role, um, we'll be leading slash and facilitating, um, I would say. So we're going to have a very sort of um, a mixed role, I imagine, um, depending on what, that it, what it is that we're doing. Um, and just the fact that, you know, we got the land legally in March this year. So we've got a long way to go um, and it's very early days. Um, so just in terms of quickly on land. Um, so as part of um, what we're going to be developing, we're going to be developing a, a management plan. So we're co-creating that with uh, community and partners to set up, set out how um, we're going to develop things, how we'll get to that, um, you know, how we'll get to that national nature reserve status, and how are we going to support large-scale ecosystem restoration? Um, you know, how are we going to do that, and what does that look like on the ground? Um, you know, across the woodlands and the peatlands, the wetlands, um, you know, the river habitat. How are we actually going to do that? And what does a nature-led, large-scale restoration approach look like? Um, and how are we going to work together to achieve that? So I think the detail of that is very much to be um, worked out. Um, but underpinning that, we've also got um, in the very early stages of a school's outdoor education at citizen science and volunteering programme. Um, and then also, um, you know, it's not just sort of inward looking but outwardly we're also um, a pilot site for um, a civ tech challenge which is um, with multiple partners uh, focused on working with tech companies to develop innovative technological solutions to help land managers um, make informed decisions about carbon capture potential of their land and um, so obviously that is uh, you know incredibly important as we start to look at you know the change in land use in our uplands um, I'll hand to you, Angela, for the last two slides. Um, and then I think that's, uh, I'll just come back to me for a summary. Would help if I unmuted. Um, so um, Jenny's job as a state manager is very much sort of leading on the land and the land management plan um, and all those activities around that. As, as development manager, um, I've got to try and make sure that um, we're there into the future, um, that we're not just a sort of flash in the pan and in three or four years time, we're sort of struggling for money. I've got to try and find a way that we can use the assets we've got, particularly the buildings, um, so that the whole project is financially, socially and environmentally sustainable into the future. And it's for us, it's really important that um, obviously we want the um, a state to be sustainable, but it's really important that the benefits are felt into the town because that way we keep the community on board with a project because they actually see a direct benefit from it. Um, the town itself and many of the community have already identified ecotourism as being a, a high priority. That covers a whole multitude of sins um, and we've got to look at different options but we've also got to look at how those options may play out. Um, you know, what happens if those ecotourism options are really successful uh, in 10 years time, but actually we've increased the footfall on the nature reserve to such an extent that we're in danger of damaging the land that, you know, people have come there to see. So there's, there's a lot of discussions to be had, um, but we will be looking at um, how we work with volunteers, volunteering holidays, glamping, wildlife tours, bunkhouse accommodation. Uh, we may well use one of the properties as a, as a self-catering let. We've, we've got to look at what the impacts are on the land around, on the uh, tracks that run across the estate. So um, while on the face of it, some of the options seem quite simple, but there are quite a number of things that we need to consider. Um, we will look at renewables as well. It's um, it is a little bit question mark how viable that, that is at the moment without any uh, feeding tariffs. Um, we've looked at the possibility of a single wind turbine, um, but also the possibility of a solar farm as well, which could have um, other benefits as well. Um, one of the new uh, posts that we're going to be recruiting, which is I think is just so exciting, is um, has been supported by a private individual to um, 
make use of sort of digital skills so we can really engage with all the people all around the world who've contributed to this so that they can monitor what we're doing, can see all the videos that are being created, can watch the flights of the hen harriers or watch the fledglings taking their first steps from a nest. So it's looking for somebody with really good digital skills to um, make this whole project come alive and engage as many people as possible with it, but, but from a distance. So that's, you know, for not having the, the direct, direct impact on the land or traveling there. Um, obviously, carbon credits is going to be something we're looking at, both in terms of um, sort of restoring peatland and uh, potentially for some new woodland as well. Um, but again, this is kind of new to us, so we've got a, a, we're on a very high learning curve uh, to make sure we really understand what we're taking on board with that. Um, we do have six properties already, four of them, as Jenny mentioned, are tenanted. Um, but when you look at the demographics of, of Langham, there's actually some quite big differences if you compare the demographics to Scotland. So the, the sort of 16 to 29 year old, um, we've got a lot less than the Scottish national average, but we've also got a much higher proportion of the over, over 60s. So again, we need to revisit that. That's from the 2011 census. Uh, it may have changed over the years. I suspect it's probably got worse and maybe more extreme. Um, Compared to some of the parts of Scotland, the housing um, situation isn't as bad as other areas, but that could be an area where we want to sort of look at um, engaging with people who might want to sort of live and work on the land that we that we own. So it's a real opportunity to sort of look at different ways of doing things and look at how we can support the town, how we can maybe bring new people in, how we can help the demographics. So again, um, the town becomes more sustainable into the future. Jenny? Great. Um, so just a summary slide. Oh, second buyout. Oh, I think we've mentioned this. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, just, it's just to say that our crowdfunder and our campaign will be launching in um, or, um, October. So please do keep an eye out. Um, so just finally, um, what does community ownership mean to Langham? Um, just some really high level points before I finish. So I think in Langham, it was about having the power to make decisions together about how mm. we become sustainable stewards and custodians of this land for generations to come. Uh, it's about bringing the community even closer with the land and its deep running cultural heritage. Um, you know, the reserve is an asset to help to support that regeneration of, a commun with the, of the community with a nature centered model. Um, you know, it's climate action on the doorstep, um, you know, helping to do our bit. Um, and the second buyout will help us to double um, what we can do under community ownership. Um, and also, I think probably we do need to mention the fact that, you know, we are in a transition phase. Um, you know, the land had been a working grouse moor for a very long time. Um, mm. And historically, you know, that played a role in the area. Um, you know, there's mixed feelings about it, but, you know, it, still played a role um, for a long time so we're in a transition into a different model of how that land is looked after mm. how it's how, how what it looks like under you know how it is how the community becomes stewards of that land and how how we what we do with it under community ownership and moving on from those past land uses um, so I think we've got a long way to go. There's no prescribed solution um, and we can learn from other places, but also, you know, what we develop in Langham will be very unique to this place. Um, and finally, um, I think the buyout was that story of the impossible dream and it was hope against the odds. And it really does, uh, for us, it really does give that power of, you know, it shows the power of community action and the power of people coming together as a collective and what we can achieve when we come together. So I think it's just, um, you know, a really positive story in, you know, what has been a very dark year for a lot of people. And um, so, yeah, that's us done. So thank you for your time. Um, there's our email addresses if anybody wants to contact. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Jenny and Angela. Uh, it's been incredibly inspiring to hear how exactly you've done this, um, what's worked, what uh, is still a challenge at the moment, and hopefully that um, hopefully this success can also set the precedent for other buyouts to happen and for 
for these community-based projects to develop further and further. Um, so thank you so much for that. Now I would like to give the stage to Paul, who will talk more about the education aspect of the peatland land ownership topic. Um, Paul, I believe you also want to share your screen, right? Yeah, I, I'll share it in a second. I just yeah, um, just introduce myself. So yeah, I'm yeah, Paul. Absolutely. Sorry, yeah, I'm based down uh, the south of. Um, on the south coast of England. Um, it kind of feels like there's a bit of a geographical spread here. It's interesting. A lot of the things I'm going to mention will be England focused. That's partly because of the, um, the availability of data. Um, I wanted to also start then with uh, a question. Uh, and here's my question. And um, I'd like you to use the chat to put in so the people in the room, if, you, if you've got an idea, throw it into the chat. If you think, you know, how many people own all the peat in England. Um, I guess I'm being uh, slightly loose with my language. I'm, I'm talking about peatlands, not not peat that you um, you know you might find at, at um, garden centres. But um, I think that's uh, another interesting argument as well as to, to think about garden centres. So yeah, have a have a guess and throw it in. Okay, so Jenny Jenny's put fifteen. Uh, we've got less than a thousand, 150, 200. So Morag, you're on the mark there. This was a statistic that was recently publicized um it's only 150 people um, which is you know as, as previous speakers have sort of highlighted this is such a small concentration of land ownership and particularly if we're thinking about something so closely related to the climate and ecological emergency and something that's so valuable so um that, that's one of the kind of um starting points is to say look there's these rather shocking statistics there's this information that actually isn't isn't very uh, widespread or known um, partly because it's sort of shrouded in secrecy so it's very difficult to find out this information but also it doesn't seem like there's um, an enthusiasm from the general public to find out about this or question it and so I come from the perspective of a teacher who um, through my teaching practice has I've always been keen to challenge the understanding and ideas of young people and to get them to think differently about the world around them. Um, so before I talk a bit more about that, I thought let's let's have a look at some of the um, specifications. So um, the way that uh, the kind of English educational system works is that we have a mix of subjects students choose particularly for something like GCSE they will choose maybe up to 11 subjects um, so they might choose geography and then for something like um, A level they might pick uh, maybe three subjects now the specifications are um, the guide or the bible almost for teachers and this gives them a really good sense of direction in terms of what they should teach so a good starting point is to think, OK, let's have a look at something like. So here is the GCSE specification. And what we can do is we can do control F and see what we can find and see how much content there is in terms of something like peat. So if I do control F and I've typed in the word peat, peat is not mentioned at all. Peatlands in GCSE geography. Um, and you might go, OK, well, let's open up this, make it a bit broader. And I could put something like. Um, uh, carbon. Um, carbon, the word carbon is not mentioned at all in GCSE geography for the OCR. Sorry, so I should say there's a handful of um, exam boards. OCR is one of the most uh, popular, but even something like carbon, a word that is so fundamental to the world we live in, um, isn't even mentioned. And so that starts to give you an idea of actually what is being taught in schools in, in England at the moment. Um, and we can jump, you might think, okay, well, it might come in into the A-level, so we can look at something like the A-level specification for a subject, for a, an exam board like OCR again, but even still, Pete's not mentioned. Yes, there is a topic called the carbon and water cycle. Um, and so, yeah, carbon is mentioned 47 times in this document. Um, and as you scroll through, you think, OK, surely Peatlands, Pete as being one of the largest stores of carbon in the UK, must be there must be some sort of reference to it, but there isn't. And really the only real focus is maybe in terms of tropical rainforests as some sort of store of carbon. So it's an interesting perspective. And it may be, I probably should caveat this to say, there are teachers in the UK who 
will be going beyond this sort of specification but it's interesting to think that this is the mainstream this is what most teachers will be will be sort of looking at um so that's a kind of starting point for this is to say look actually the reality is the um the guidance that's given to teachers in england in the uk uh, in terms of what should be taught so i can say with um done analysis similarly on things like science so we've looked at the science specifications you know it's not like these words come up in there either this is just missing from what is being taught um, to uh, young people at the moment and so one thing that we did is we got together a group of um teachers and we said look let's come up with something that's a bit different and it's called the radical school geography and um, what we're aiming to do is to come at the what's taught in in uk schools in terms of geography from a slightly different perspective and try and push that critical edge so get young people to engage with a slightly different lens in terms of the world around them and to be um to be questioning and to uh, explore and, and question the structures so both in terms of the physical but also social structures around them and to explore their role within society and so um we kind of advocating a type of learning and um, exploration, which is um, kind of based around young people actually being actors and um, playing a role within society and kind of understanding that. Um, and I guess the, the reason, uh, one of the big focuses for this as well is just within that context of the Anthropocene and thinking that look, we live within an age at the moment where humans are having such a significant impact on um, the planet that we really need to be educating young people with that in mind and so um the next step off this then is um as a group of teachers we read these two books so i have to acknowledge uh, guy and nick in terms of uh, the book of trespass parson who owns england and it was, it was reading these two books that inspired me and, and a group of other teachers to collaborate and come up with some teaching resources and materials that any teacher can use freely and access um, to engage young people more critically in ideas of land ownership um, and land justice. Because the other thing I would say is that the reality is, I think just in terms of broad society, there are very few people questioning land ownership and access rights. So I think people are sort of lulled into a full sense of um, freedom in terms of having footpaths and uh, being able to wander around and not quite questioning actually who owns the land and that might be because there are big walls and, and kind of forests in the way so that you can't necessarily see these spaces or, the, or this um, land and I think the reality as well for young people is even more they um kind of their default is to not necessarily question these or not even think that they should question them so it's an important thing um, to raise so what I should also do as well, sorry, is just, just mention as well as Nick and Guy's books, there's a whole variety of organisations who are working within this space and, and they're also doing some wonderfully kind of excellent uh, resources and work. So we've got people like Three Acres and a Cow, which is a kind of folk based um, touring group who take a kind of performance between schools and there's some really good resources that they've created around exploring the history of land ownership and particularly the act of enclosure i think that's definitely something that's often missed from uh, even history uh, kind of specifications and history courses and young people even if they do look at it they don't necessarily look at it within the significance that, that it needs in terms of how land has been um, kind of amassed within the uk and then we've got the Land Workers Alliance, we've got People's Land Policy, and then also other organisations looking in terms of solutions and thinking about um, how we can actually solve this. And, and I know on the call as well, there's sort of other organisations as well who are doing some equally wonderful things. So um, just like the 150 people own all the peat in England, you know, there's this statistic that actually came up in the in the video earlier that's there's less than one percent of the population in england who um, own half of the land and in reality that's tens of thousands of people so such concentrated land ownership has a significant impact on things like the way that land is managed and there are very few people who are making all the choices um uh so this or these here are the resources so it's a series of seven lessons that take students through a sort of journey 
getting them to explore a whole variety of different aspects. And I'm just going to uh, talk through a few of them in a bit more detail. Um, I've got another fun activity, which is actually the starter of, of one of the lessons um, here, just again to see if or see how well you know uh, England. Um, so you might have seen 56 million. That's the population of England. Percentage tree cover. Does anyone want to have a guess in the chat? What percentage? So it's one of the numbers along the bottom. What percentage of England is covered in trees? Uh, Scotland's got a higher percentage. Yeah, so 10, only 10% 10 of the UK covered in trees. We think historically within um, kind of how that's changed and varied. There's some interesting arguments and, and ideas about then comparing that with other countries around the world. You think about rates of deforestation in places like Brazil, actually they've got a larger percentage tree cover than we do in the U in uh, England and some interesting ideas to then discuss with students. Um, so this is a kind of an in, this is a, a way to get young people to think about, you know, what do we uh, conceive around this idea of England? How do we think about it? Uh, partly playing on stereotypes, but also the facts of, of numbers. I jump now to the uh, scheme of work and I'm just gonna highlight these, I'm just gonna focus, sorry, I'm just gonna change the view a little bit so that you can see a bit more of it. Um, so seven lessons and the idea is, um, Students go, as I was saying, sort of through a journey, and it's partly dipping into resources and maps and kind of things that are already available. So one of the ones, this first task uses the National Trust report linking National Trust properties to um, the legacy of British slavery. And there's also a really useful UCL database as well that does that, where you can search local properties or search your area and find out, uh, you know, how your local area is connected to um, the kind of legacy of slavery. So that's also an interesting one for young people, because often, you know, they might with their family visit something like National Trust property, but they never might actually make that connection and they might not quite understand. Um, and again, that's something that's been in the press a lot recently. Um, the, this then goes on to think about um, the idea of trespass and should it be illegal because well, technically at the moment it's um, not a criminal offence and that's obviously something that is coming through uh, with some new bills in the House of Parliament and again that's something that's interesting for young people to engage with realising what's happening in terms of the political situation and how that then could potentially further impinge on their ability to engage and access um, space or, or land around them. I think the other thing that this does as well is puts land ownership as well and, and some of the direct action in the context of uh, history in terms of the Kinder Scout movement as well. And I think that's something often that's missed from education in terms of young people. Um, and actually, for some communities, those sorts of direct actions have a, um, a really uh, kind of strong connection even to today. And I think young people um it within a school context might often miss that they, they might not quite understand and, and hear about those sorts of things um this activity uh, here about the language of trespass this comes from nick's book and it's a really interesting one in the sense of how uh, he emphasizes how uh, kind of strong the link is between lots of the language and phrasing uh, or phraseology that we use within the english language um the idea of sort of forgive us our trespasses and, and how closely linked the idea of physical borders are also in terms of our psyche. And that again is, is an interesting angle to explore. Um, the lessons then go on to look at things like um, empty homes um, and within the context, maybe this one is of, of Grenfell and, and rehoming um, the people who uh, lost their homes in, in uh, that um, event. And then also thinking about overseas ownership. And that's one thing that there's some particularly interesting and, and good maps to be able to um, encourage young people to explore their local area and to understand actually how many overseas companies based in tax havens own pockets of land within their local area. And that is, I've often found is a really eye-opening experience for young people because they can walk past these spaces, but there's no signs or um, it's very rarely the opportunity to actually understand who owns the spaces and where they're those people or companies are based and then there's a whole argument or discussion around why are these um, 
pockets of land owned by companies based in tax havens what's the reasoning behind that what might be the purpose and often it's very difficult actually to find who owns the land and then that makes the situation even more complex um the lessons kind of then go on to think about nature and that's maybe where um, some of what we've seen before fits in as well focusing on things like grouse moors and the behavior of a very small group of people in terms of then the management of quite large areas in terms of um, the burning of this moorland and then the impact that has on the ability of those spaces to be able to um, uh, sequester carbon. Um, ultimately they it, it then starts to think about the solutions and I think that's a really important aspect when engaging with young people is to actually be solutions focused and to look to empower to, to sort of um, focus on the ability for young people to actually have action an agency in terms of what they can do and ultimately the um, lessons culminate in a debate all around the motion which is should land be returned to the masses so it's a rather provocative idea in that sense and quite extreme but it leads to some really interesting discussion around actually the merits of the current situation of what is quite concentrated land ownership and then the idea of returning it to some sort of um, really um, extreme system where every person maybe has an acre. Um, so I think that's maybe the end of, of me presenting. What I would say is that um, all of these resources are freely accessible. And that's something that we're really keen to emphasize is that we are a, a kind of a, a collaboration of teachers and everything we want to do is within that same kind of ethic of wanting to freely share and make everything accessible. So that it has the largest impact. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Really cool to have this insight into your approach to education and once again, uh, very inspiring and I think something that many of us will take uh, important learnings from. Uh, so now we've had uh, all the speakers and um, I would like to invite the participants uh, that have any questions to um, either put them in the chat or if you would like to speak them out, uh, raise your hand and then I'll give you um, the turn. But uh, perhaps in the meantime, I would like to ask both Angela, Paul, Jenny and Hazel if uh, you would like to re yeah, respond to each other's presentations or sort of make any connections perhaps that weren't uh, highlighted yet in the um, content so far. So whoever feels like sharing anything, just unmute yourself and um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Paul, I see your hand, go ahead. One of the things I'm most excited about is engaging young people in the initiatives that have been mentioned. So finding ways to connect schools with the, the uh, community buyouts and having young people participate. And then also the idea of the wild card campaign. Imagine if um, local schools took some sort of sense of responsibility in campaigning and lobbying local landowners. So there was almost this sense of um, having more of an ownership within their local area and engaging in those sorts of issues around them and I think that's a really powerful uh, way to think about solutions to the climate and nature emergency is to actually let's get young people engaged in positive actions that are that are actually creating and, and changing the world around them. Great idea I already see Frankie in the chat I can see a great collaboration on the horizon <laughs> Uh, I hope Hazel feels the same way. Same goes for Angela and Jenny. Uh, is there any chance, uh, Jenny, I see you unmute yourself as well. Like, have yeah. you already been trying to uh, take this approach? Um, yeah, so um, we've we've just had some funding from um, the Hollywood Trust and um, a wind farm that I've forgotten the name of. Hughes Hill Wind Farm. I really need to remember the funders, but we've got some funding to um, begin, um, you know, developing and bringing on board. You know, it's inspiring um, young people with nature and starting to do that engagement and starting to bring people into the conversation about how do we look after this land now? We all like, you know, now it's in community ownership, and 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 I think one of the things that we want to really do is get younger people involved in the future of this land and and what that looks like because at the end of the day i think that you know the the young people are going to inherit whatever we you know the disaster that we've that's been created you know we need to make sure that they're part of the conversation and engaged from now you know is it is so important and um, so i think 
yeah that's what i so we we that's a real priority for us Yeah, amazing to hear, Jenny, and I think we can all agree with you uh, on that. Um, also, a question from Kate uh, for the Lancome Initiative. Um, have you thought about pioneering remote connections which do not harm the land we want to take care for? Um, Kate, would you like to elaborate a little bit on your question? Well, I think it's, it's all there, but I, I'm so aware that of the challenge which um, the Langham Initiative mentioned of if you have lots of people that want to go there is it difficult for the land itself and like especially for birds during breeding season so the option of having like the webcams is of the curlews or the hen harriers is, is one brilliant thing but maybe there's lots more and I, I wondered what you were thinking of. Well we've, we've got um we're, we're literally just about completing a job description um for, the, for this post um and although we've highlighted uh, things like the sort of nest cams and uh, tagging and um, sort of inspirational videos and what have you, we've also said, but we're also open. Uh, I think there's so much in the digital world that as a non-techie person, um, there's so much out there that we could make use of. And I think what um, I find potentially really exciting, there's a lot of focus with this job on we've had so much support from all around the world so if you're in Australia you'll still be able to watch this in in real time but I also think it's good for um we can take it back into the town itself so that you're right not everybody has to or not everybody can go out and and walk on the moors and um, some people will but a lot of people won't but this is a chance that people can say in the town they can engage with it and that way as well it's a bit of a double whammy they're not doing any damage but they're also um bringing life and um sort of finance into into the town center as well so that means the community again see a benefit so things like that could be a real win-win so i'm just really looking forward to having getting this person in post and hoping that they're going to have some superb ideas to to make a difference with this but i think it's a really interesting point because i hadn't even though we were doing this i hadn't necessarily thought of it as a way of um, always minimising some of the impact on the land, and I mustn't—I don't think we—we we mustn't forget about that, Jenny, because I think that's an extra an extra sell for it. Um, it's a real two two way um, benefit. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just to add to that, the, the focus is on like a um, a digital journey of landscape restoration. So it's just using you know innovative ways to capture how the land restores and changes, and getting that journey captured in really you know creative ways digitally and um, so yeah it's quite a blank slate of how we do it but um, it's a really exciting project yeah for sure i was also uh, wondering uh, the approach by wildcard and the lancome initiative like they they're quite different and i guess like they could um, they could relate to each other in different ways, like perhaps complementary or at some instances also in tension with one another, because the foundation of the idea uh, sort of rewilding um, uh, with the owners still in place versus really rethinking this idea of land ownership. Like, do you have any thoughts, like any of the speakers, about how these approaches um, are in relation to one another? I think um, I think uh, it's really good Lancome is providing this fantastic model all the aims that are there are ones are aims that we'd want for all of our land really and um, the practicalities of everybody being able to own their own land um, I think with uh, Paul's education plan that might come in the future but we're not there now and you know whichever side of the wall you're standing on if the person on the other side of the wall is doing good for the you know they're rewilding their land and they're restoring their land that's gonna benefit everybody um the more examples we can see of whatever type the better will be placed for the future to work out the best way forward i think I definitely echo that it's about the diversity of approach isn't it and, and you know what might work in Langham might not necessarily work somewhere else yeah. but then it's just getting that diversity and, and and getting it across the board isn't it so I think that's definitely um 
yeah. I think what's, what's everybody so, needs to do it, basically. Yeah. I think what's been so interesting about tonight, and I, I've worked on for community landowners for the last 20 years, so community land, land ownership is just, it's just second nature to me. It's where I've spent a large part of my working life. Um, and so, you know, I get a bit, um, you get on my soapbox about it sometimes, and I know when I'm talking to sort of family or friends, you know, yeah, I can now start to see the penny drop with them, especially, you know, sort of down in England of actually questioning who owns land, because it is such a fundamental question. And it's one we take for granted, it's one we ignore. And, and I know when I moved up to Scotland from, I'd been work, working down in, in Lancashire, I moved up to Scotland and I, I was kind of dismissive that England had the same issues of land ownership to, to Scotland. And it took me a while to realise what a political issue land is, how fundamental it is in, the, in this country and in the world. If you own land, you, you have power, you can make decisions, you can, with, at one level, you can do what you want with that land subject of planning permission or what have you. And, and uh, getting people to explore and ask questions about who owns it, it's not, a, it's not a threat, it's a right that you should know who is owning land near you and we're doing a lot of work on that in Scotland to make sure that's much much more accessible so it's not hiding behind corporations but I think what Paul's doing of just getting kids in school to ask such a basic question because so much comes on from that it's so so important. I think you're making a great case here Angela uh, I was wondering if Paul you have any thoughts on this uh, conversation as well? The, the, the one that I thought was quite interesting was this idea of questioning carbon offsetting and carbon credits, because I think that's another interesting aspect as well. That obviously, I can see the value in terms of landowners gaining value from land, you know, doing sort of natural processes and, and locking away carbon. But there's a double edged sword in there in the sense that then you're also reinforcing behaviours that we want to stop, you know, this idea of because um, this again connects with schools, schools do so many trips or have in the past done trips abroad. And then teachers have said, look, is there a carbon offset scheme that we can use? And, and actually, the reality is, we just shouldn't be doing those behaviours that release the carbon. And so having carbon offsetting or almost allows people to, to then be able to behave in those ways. I wonder what people think about that. Maybe I'll just, I don't know if I have like a really good answer to that. I just remember that um, uh, a couple of years ago, a few of us went to the COP in, in um, Madrid. And there was also a counter COP that was happening at the same time. Uh, and they had a lot of indigenous voices from South America. And there were a lot of presentations where they were questioning this carbon crediting and um, questioning how then, yeah, particularly corporations then, if they want to offset and then pushing people from the land as well. Um, so that, you know, people who've lived there for generations no longer have access to that land because um, somebody needs to offset their carbon. So they like really were very critical of this idea and that's always kind of stuck with me whenever I'm thinking now about carbon capture and stuff is really like what what are the people who are living closer to nature and are having these um uh impacts and being uh, like shunted off their land or whatever what what is their view on this you know and so it's always made me kind of question this a lot just two cents I don't know if that's like a wide thing but Hazel, go ahead. Yeah, I think with all of this, there's got to be two key things that lead the way, given the situation we're in. Um, and one of them is the just transition, which you've just talked about just then. And the other thing is science. And at the moment, economics is the thing making the decisions. And we need justice and we need um, science to be making all us all our decisions so that we can be future proofed and it's um you know if, if we're going to rewild our grouse moors what's going to happen to the gamekeepers are they just going to be turfed out of their homes that that's not fair on that you know when there is opportunity to work with them um at the same time when economics is becoming a barrier for somebody to rewild their land then if you can give kind of some sort of tax credits to enable them to do that, that's really important because 
although the landowners that we may be targeting may be quite rich, a lot of our landowners aren't, um, they're living, you know, month to month um, and they need help in order to take risks. So put science at the top, put justice at the top, then you have a more pure debate. And from that, the economics should follow. I feel like Angela still would like to say something. I, I do have to know that we're running out of time a little bit. So Angela, I would like, if you could keep it brief, that would Very be amazing. Easy. And then I will wrap it up. Yeah. It was Thank just you. picking up on Hazel's point, which I do agree about when you were talking about, say, if a gamekeeper or equivalent is going to lose their jobs, I think that is a really important issue because it's at the end of the day, it's people and their families we're talking about. But I would just like to counter that. If you look at, it's certainly in the world of community buyouts, you look at where communities have taken land and the number of jobs they have created might not be a gamekeeper per se job, but some of the skills are very, very similar, but there might be a different emphasis. And it's an important point because the argument about um, I'm going to, we will create unemployment is one that can be used by certain parties. And I think there is a counter argument to it, but yes, don't forget the people. Yeah, a good one, Angela. Uh, thank you also for keeping it brief. I think that this is a discussion that um, probably needs to be continued. And I'm very happy that we uh, at least started scratching the surface and got a lot of insight into um, interesting examples of approaches with how to go about this. Um, and if the speakers of tonight would like to share their contact information in the chat, I think uh, that would be really amazing. There are some questions that we certainly didn't get around to answering and then hopefully the people that are interested in following up on these topics uh, know where to reach out to. Um, I would just like to say that, the, as I said at the start as well, this um, panel discussion, I guess you could call it, is part of an ongoing series that we are hosting with Repeat. And the next one we have is on peatlands and gardening on the September 28th. Um, and I would just like to do a massive thanks to the speakers of tonight for joining us and also for the uh, everyone that has attended this webinar tonight to be for being engaged and uh, showing up and we hope to see you in the next one as well and I will stay around for another few minutes if anyone has any questions. I see a raised hand to Alison. Would you like to speak? That was a mistake. I was trying to find a way to <laughs> applaud. I'd like to say thank you to Paul as an ex-teacher. I'm so delighted to see such wonderfully well-developed curricula. And I did have a question. So um, I'm Frankie's grandmother. So if he wants to answer to Frankie, then she'll get it to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Okay, it doesn't seem like anybody has any questions anymore. So I guess, uh, Bethany, would you like to end the Zoom meeting here? Sure, thank you everyone. Um, just also just to say that we wanna keep having these conversations also with Repeat as well. So hopefully that comes into something else in a different form and in, in some kind of discussion or podcast or whatever, some other point. Um, thank you. I'm gonna end it now, sorry. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye.